So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to pray again. I was muted. So let's uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. A uh, dear Father in heaven, uh, we invite your presence here as we open your word together. May your Holy Spirit teach us and lead us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So good morning again. Now we've been looking at this book by Robert W. Olson, I believe, who uh, put together this compilation long time ago, something that I studied in the upper room and studies that we had in the attic of my house. And I wanted to look at this again uh, because I know that there was many statements here in the spirit of prophecy that had an impact upon me back when I was a little younger. So we're we're on point number eight. We're going to just read through these things and we're, these are basically points for discussion. Right. We know this is in a question and answer form. So will the United States continue to be a favored nation after she has legally set aside the law of God? And uh, we, we could probably answer that question. Uh, but here it says the people of the United States have been a favored people. But when they restrict religious liberty, surrender Protestantism and give countenance to popery, the measure of their guilt will be full. A national apostasy will be registered in the books of heaven. And so, that, so that's from Review and Herald, uh, May 2nd, 1893. And then we have from 5T451. So may this apostasy be assigned to us, that the limit of God's forbearance is reached and that the measure of our nation's iniquity is full. What will be the result of this national apostasy? The time is coming when the law of God, in a special sense, in a special sense, to me be, is in a special sense to be made void in our land. The rulers of our nation will, by legislative enactments, enforce the Sunday law, and thus God's people will be brought into great peril. When our nation, in its legislative councils, shall enact laws to bind the consciousness, the consciences of men in regard to their religious privileges, enforcing Sunday observance and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. The law of God will, to all intents and purposes, be made void in our land, and national apostasy will be followed by national ruin. And of course, we're all familiar with that last phrase there. Uh, December 18th, 1888, Review and Herald. So written uh, or published uh, one week before Christmas in 1888. Now, of course, um, you know, these are things we're familiar with and, and people are welcome to, to make comments on things that strike them or things they have questions on. And so this idea of national apostasy and national ruin, we know then that this, that the United States, which this is referring to directly, is going to have, well, it's going to be the fall of the United States, right? National ruin is similar to what happened to Rome, right? Roman Empire fell. The United States is going to fall. And, and what that actually will look like, you know, people can speculate a little bit, but we do have lots of counsel in the spirit of prophecy. When, one is we know there's going to be a civil war. And how that works out exactly, we don't know. But um, she goes on. Anyway, it is at the time of national apostasy when acting on the policy of Satan, the rulers of the land will rank themselves on the side of the man of sin. It is then the measure of guilt is full. The national apostasy is the signal for national ruin. The result of this apostasy, apostasy will be national ruin. So those one was from... Uh, General uh, General Conference Bulletin, 1891. The other ones from May 2nd, 1893, which so we quoted from already. The Protestants will work upon the rulers of the land to make laws to restore the lost ascendancy of the man of sin, who sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Roman Catholic principles will be taken under the care and protection of the state the national apostasy will speedily be followed by national ruin. The Protestant governments will reach a strange pass. They will be converted to the world 
They will also, in their separation from God, work to make falsehood and apostasy from God the law of the nation. Now, um, so this is something we've discussed before, and we, we still need to examine um, the idea that uh, we have three different powers involved here, right? So what, what are the three powers involved here that she has in this quote? We have Roman Catholic principles. So that's the beast. The Protestant governments. That's the false prophet. And the world. That's the dragon power. So why, why do all three of these have to come together to form the Sunday law? Well, one supports the other. Okay. One supports the other. Yeah. Okay. So this, this relates to the question that that we all always have had is how does the Sunday law come about? So some people like to focus a lot upon the Catholic church, right? That's the real, the real enemy. Uh, Daniel Fontenot sort of in that class. He really likes to focus upon uh, the Catholic church, the papacy. And, and of course we know the papacy is behind this. Now, some people, especially, you know, Recently, because of what what happened in 2020, uh, they really like to focus upon uh, the dragon power, whether they describe it as the World Economic Forum or the globalists or whatever they want to call it. Right. There's lots of different names that they could give it. But they, they look at that as that that's the power really that brings about the Sunday law that that that's going to oppress us. So that's the world. Right. And then we have uh, the Protestant governments, as Ellen White calls them here, apostate Protestantism. So really Protestant in name only. So so some people really focus upon what's happening in the United States. We would look at, uh, you know, used to be in the 90s, the moral majority, the religious right, the evangelicals, however we want to characterize that. Now. The problem that I always have had is how do we get the world that is not Christian to support a Sunday law? And and when we look at it here, it says, you know, that the Protestants are converted to the world. It doesn't say the world is converted to Protestantism, right? They're almost so, converted to the world now. Yeah, well, yeah. In a, of, in a lot of ways, yeah. Yeah, so, so we have to try to figure out... Well, so if Christianity becomes converted to the world to bring about a Sunday law, what does that actually mean? So, I mean, one of the, I mean, I'm going to put it in quotations, attractive uh, aspects that uh, Tess had was, you know, that this wasn't going to be a Sunday law at all, that it was going to be about human rights. That in Ellen White's day, it was, a, it would have been a Sunday law if it happened at that time, but now, you know, it, in our time, it's about human rights. Uh, and this was a, a sort of actually a beguiling idea because it did answer to some of the problems, right? Like, how, how do we get people to actually support the Sunday, which is a Catholic uh, institution, you know, a child of the papacy? You know, how do we how do we get everybody to buy into this? And so there are different theories, you know, there's. Well, the environmental Sunday law or uh, the labor union Sunday law, right? Uh, because, you know, we need that, you know, the labor unions push for a Sunday law so that people can have more time off. Um, environmental right. labor, of course, you know, if you don't have stuff happening one day a week, you know, it'll help the environment. Or the Project 2025 Sunday law. Which is what? Just a religious oh, project. Yeah, they, they're proposing the, yeah, it's a group of, well, the Heritage Foundation in the United States. They've been around for quite a while. They basically prepare an agenda that they want the pres next president, Republican president to follow. Yeah, except they all disbanded anyway. So, uh, oh, Project 2025 has been shelved. But anyway. That's all right. Interesting. Yeah. That's an okay. update for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so a religious Sunday law. Now, the, the religious Sunday law, right? I mean, that's, that's what we've always looked at. 
we know that there is going to be a religious Sunday law. For in order to it to be a Sunday law, it needs to be religious, right? The environmental Sunday law doesn't cut it for me, nor, nor the labor union Sunday law. And and the, and it needs to be enforced. It needs to be it, its its religious aspect needs to be seen. It's in order for it to have any meaning, right? But we see that all of these three powers come together. So each of them has their own particular interests, their particular reason. And and what is the reason that unites them? Uh, desire to return to their former prosperity? No. Okay. Uh, okay, go on. I've got a question. I'll ask later. Yeah. So... So we think about these, these different powers, right? These, you know, you think about the Democrats in the United States. I mean, would they be interested in a Sunday law? No, right? Like a religious Sunday law. Many of them are atheists, you know, even if they do go to church, but you know, the Democrats have become part of this. It's much more secular way of looking at the world than you would have with Republicans. I mean, it's obviously mixed, right? But um, uh, they wouldn't be looking for a Sunday law. They wouldn't be looking to promote religion. So, you know, how, what are their interests? What, what would it be that would unite the Protestants, the dragon power, and the papacy to form a Sunday law? What, what, what usually allows uh, people to, to ally themselves with one another when they have different interests? A, cri- a crisis? Yeah. Desperate okay. situations, a crisis, yeah. Nope. All right. Go on, teacher. Usually, it's a common enemy. Ah, yes. Okay. That's why I use the word ally. You know, ally. <laughs> Alliances, yeah, the allies, yes. Right. So people who, uh, you know, nations that often are opposed to each other, when they have a common enemy, will unite to defeat that enemy, right? I mean, they're often ready to stab each other in the back, you know, once that enemy is defeated. And, and I think that that is what is going to happen is that the reason that they unite is they have a common enemy. Now, the question is, who is that enemy? Well, well, wouldn't that be a crisis? Because if you got an enemy and the enemy is attacking you, you're in a crisis, ain't you? Not necessarily, no. Oh, so, okay. All right. Right. <laughs> you just need to have a common enemy. Uh, I mean, yeah, you, an, but it's not what give, I would call a crisis. Okay, what's that? Give us, an, give, give us an example of where it would be a crisis, but not a common, wouldn't. Draw people together. But when I think of a crisis, I think of as crisis is like, you know, a natural disaster, an economic crash, things like that. Well, the environmental uh, religion seems to be drawing everybody in. Uh, I mean, there isn't a, there isn't a real crisis though. It's no real crisis. Well, there's a, not a real crisis. Yeah, it's an agenda right. crisis. Yeah, uh, you're yeah. created through the media. We're, we're I'm sorry, Kelly. Don't we have a don't we have a um don't we have an example of that of nine eleven? Yes, that's why I wanted to come in. Like the con the, the common enemy, is it not uh, Islam? I know. So who's the common enemy? I'm saying Islam. You're saying it is Islam? Okay. Yeah. I, I don't think that it's Islam. It's interesting the protesters in the States protesting what is it? Uh, the thing going on between Palestine and Israel. Uh, that the uh, is it the Palestinian protesters on the university campuses are uh, not disres- They're disrespectful. They're they're causing a lot of chaos in the Israeli. Apparently, the Israeli protesters are uh, in favor of Israel. Are like getting permits and cleaning up after themselves and orderly protests. 
Okay. Yeah. I mean, and it, so, you know, didn't mean to be so abrupt, basically the idea that it's not Islam because Islam has a part to play. Islam is, has been an excuse for, uh, uh, upping the ante on taking away our rights, right? Our freedoms. Correct. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. But we have to remember Satan is behind it. Who is who is who is the enemy as far as Satan is concerned? It's definitely not Islam because Islam is well, a Satan power. Well God's come down to God's people. Okay. Right? Yeah. Amen. So so if it's God's people, when do God's people become a threat to these three powers? To the papacy, to apostate Protestantism? And to the world, when they begin to expose the the works of darkness through keeping Sabbath rather than Sunday. How, how about um, when they begin to, to reflect? Christ, how about when they begin to reflect Christ's character more? Uh, yes, yes. You know, because because I've thought about this a bit. You know, maybe not as much as I should have, but you know. It, in, in going to the study on uh, Genesis 3.15, which I did on Wednesday, a Bible study, it started there, um, dealing with the origin of sin and the first gospel promise. I will put enmity between the seed and the wo- between thy seed and the woman, or between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, talking to the serpent, right, to Satan. So the real enmity is between the promised seed which, of course, we know is Christ, but Christ also in his people is the promised seed as well. And Satan and his seed, those actuated by Satan. And we would have to say that the dragon, the beast and the false prophet are all actuated by Satan. Right. So the real yeah. hate, um, the, the real reason that, you know, that we're going to see a Sunday law, like we sort of put the cart before the horse. As Seventh-day Adventists, we're waiting for, well, when some crisis happens, when some some event happens, then all of these events are going to happen that are then going to perfect our character so that, you know, we can stand in the time of trouble, right? So we're waiting for some event. We're waiting for something hap- to happen before we are changed. No, yeah, maybe some are, but yeah, I think it's going to be, happen before. I've been thinking about it as well, that, and just the experience of, you know, I how I see myself is not how God sees me, how others might see me. Like, I've had some really nice things said about me here, but I don't see myself as, as uh, like that. I... When I do realize that I'm being like Jesus to others, it's very humbling. And I, I personally believe that, like I said it before, that the outpouring of the latter rain will not happen and cannot happen until we are reflecting the character of Christ. When, and it's interesting that there's no opposition to having Buddha or alternate forms of spirituality but when i start living like a christian it it's like people start getting agitated and uncomfortable yeah um, now there's of course some people are attracted to yeah of course like character and some people are opposed so so when we look at this test we know it's going to be manifest in this sunday law but if there wasn't God's people representing Christ, there would be no necessity of a Sunday law. Expand on that. Well, why would you have to force people to keep Sunday if everybody just went along with Sunday? Right? You have to have people who have developed a character in opposition to it. So, so my point is that God's people, that there has to be a revival and a reformation among God's people before these events can occur. 
We're waiting for those events to occur to cause the revival and reformation for the most part within Adventism, right? The Sunday law comes, then, you know, God will give us his spirit. We'll give the loud cry, you know, then we will reflect Christ's character. But, but that has to happen first. We have to reflect Christ's character before the Sunday law comes. I see it. Reflecting Christ's character will cause trouble. Yeah. And like, what yeah. is it? What is the, how does the quote go that, um, <clears throat> the, the rising up will be caused by the message? The message. Yeah, so, the, so the counsel of the true witness to the Laodicea, and it's the rising up against the message that causes the shaking amongst God's people. It's not the counsel of the true witness that causes the shaking. It's the rising up against the counsel. Yeah. That causes the shaking. Right. Right. But yeah. So, you know, so what, what I'm saying is that, you know, when, when we looked at this issue, when I back in the upper room studies in the, you know, in the mid eighties. So we're, we're studying these things, you know, the general idea that uh, Adventist had is, you know, one day, you know, a Sunday law is going to come, you know, the morning paper, you know, we'll open up the paper because it's before the internet. Right. And, you know, as you see, you know, national Sunday laws, the headlines and, you know, uh, Oh, now there's a Sunday law. I know where I'm going to stand on that Sunday law. I mean, that's just kind of the picture that we had in our minds and, and people expressed it that way. And there wasn't really so much this focus on how does that Sunday law come about? Why does it come about? We just think it comes about because they're planning this Sunday law. and One day they're going to spring it on us. But it's in response to something. Now, I do think that there is a re religious revival that is occurring. There's a false religious revival as well and a true. And you with know, it, I, Theodore, I agree with you. I think that you're right about that. I didn't, I didn't think about it in that way. Yeah, and, and I think that there is a religious revival that is occurring. That is, there are people around the world in, in, in sort of an intellectual environment who are becoming Christian. People are recognizing, because of what's happened in the world, that, that there's sort of a kind of basic Christianity that's coming back. Now, some of it's institutionalized Christianity, but a lot of it's not. A lot of it's just a personal uh, Christianity. Right. It's not um, it's not part of some movement or some church or some organization. It's not contrived. Um, it's just people are coming to a realization that God is real and that that he is the answer. Now, in response to that, of course, there's going to be a lot of hatred. So how exactly things are going to unfold and what's exactly going to happen in Adventism, you know, how that's going to look. It, it's hard to know all the details. But I do think that many, the people who are waking up to the reality of what's happening, that many of these will come to reveal Christ's character. And that's what's going to bring about the hatred. Not so much that people have political ideas or that um, they're, uh, you know, taking over the, the institutions so much. But it's the character of Christ being manifest in his people. That's really going to create the anger and and the the resolve that's going to bring about a unity of these powers. So it, it's 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 just an idea. It's just you know trying to figure this out, this puzzle out of what's going to bring about a Sunday law. You know, God, He's not going to bring about the Sunday law when His people are not ready. If you understand what I'm saying. Like, it's not an arbitrary event. The Sunday law is not something arbitrary. Now, part of it is that the world is getting worse. But but when the world gets worse, uh, God's people get better. You know, like the two things go hand in hand. This division of the two classes comes from the proclamation of a message. Now, that message has been unfolding in events that have occurred as far as the world is concerned, right? 1989, 9-11, and, and um, you know, we could even say uh, the pandemic are these three events that in, in a way illustrate the three angels' messages. 
and and the Sunday law would then be the fourth. So so there's something there's something going on that I think we need to consider. That's all I'm trying to say. I understand you know the role of Islam, right? I understand um, you know these different uh, disasters that are going to occur, you know crises, economic crises, and so forth, civil war, all of these things. But the underlying element has to be that God's people are being prepared for the time that's coming, right? That's Both pretty much how. It's pretty that, much how I. It's pretty much how I thought about was thinking on July 18. I knew I wasn't ready, and I'm pretty sure I. I can see others weren't, so I didn't think that that something like that would happen though i knew it was correct chron- chronologically speaking yeah and i and, and when i think when i when i think of this coming crisis i i think of uh christ being our uh, example in all things and and uh, when his character caused people to go into a rage against him give us barabbas yeah. Yeah. So there's the separation of these two classes. Satan is is gathering, um, you know, his people to to the Battle of Armageddon. Right. He's he's there's people that are being prepared by Satan and there's people being prepared by Christ. OK, so this next statement says when Protestant churches shall unite with the secular power to re- sustain a false religion. For opposing which their ancestors uh, endured the fiercest persecution, then will the papal Sabbath be enforced by the combined authority of church and state? There will be a national apostasy, which will end only in national ruin. So you again see the three different forces being brought together. How does Protestant America form an image to the beast? When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held in, by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institutions, then the Protestant, then Protestant America will have formed an image to the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of uh, civil penalties, penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. So we've looked at this quote before. So we know that... Um, there's an ecumenism going on, right? The points of doctrine, ecumenical movement. Um, and when the church loses the power of the gospel, they seek the power of the state. So they uh, want to influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institutions. And and they're going to form an image to the Roman hierarchy. So they're going to act in the way that the Catholic Church had enacted in the past. The very act of enforcing a religious duty by secular power in the very act of enforcing a religious duty by secular power, the churches would themselves form an image to the beast. Hence, the enforcement of Sunday keeping in the United States would be an enforcement of the worship of the beast and his image. So those are pretty clear ideas. Will the enforcement of Sunday keeping the forming of an image of the beast in the United States, follow or proceed the close of probation. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. Now, of course, we had within this movement a discussion regarding uh, a close of probation for the church and a close of probation for the world. So the Sunday law becomes a test for the people of God, God's people. Their probation will close first. That's not the, the when God closes probation, says let him that is righteous be righteous still, etc. That is not some arbitrary act, but a pronouncement of what is. So work will have been accomplished before everyone's probation will have closed. Now, many people will have closed their probation by death martyrs and other people. Um, So when probation closes, uh, there will have been great crises that had preceded those things. Um, You know, what that's exactly going to look like, we don't know. How these things are going to unfold, we don't know. 
by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when, under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. As the approach of the Roman armies was assigned to the disciples of the impending destruction of Jerusalem, so may this apostasy be assigned to us that the limit of God's forbearance is reached, that the measure of our nation's iniquity is full, and that the angel of mercy is about to take her flight, never to return. Now, we know that there are these two quotes. There's one from Great Controversy and one from Five Testimonies. So this one from Five Testimonies, 451, it's going to have um, Protestants stretch their hand across the gulf, where the one in Great Controversy says, um, uh, to, to grasp hands with the Roman power. The other one's going to say, stretch across the gulf to grasp hands with spiritualism. So they invert, uh, they still always have the gulf and the abyss first, you know, in that order, gulf and then abyss, but they switch. And we said that's because of the different emphases. This one's emphasizing uh, uh, the Catholic Church and its doctrines. The other ones, which is the Sunday particularly, and the other ones uh, emphasizing spiritualism, the state of the dead, right? So that's why it's going to have spiritualism first. That's my theory, right? That's why I think they're inverted. The, the topic is different. Um, now, this is an interesting quote from Second Selected, Selected Messages, verse uh, page 81. Anna's vision, that's Anna Rice, I believe, is her last name? Anna something Rice? That's how I, yeah, that's how I remember it. Yeah. Uh, visions place the forming of the image of the beast after probation closes. This is not so. You claim to believe the testimonies. Let them set you right on this point. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before the probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God, by which uh, their eternal destiny will be decided. So, yeah, I don't know why that would ever be a problem with Adventists. We, we, we pretty much know that probation closing is after the Sunday law. In view of the anticipated Sunday legislation, what our city dwelling Adventist urged to do as soon as possible. He wants us to live where we can have elbow room. His people are not to crowd into the cities. He wants them to take their families out of the cities that they may better prepare for eternal life. In a little while, they will have to leave the cities, get out of the cities as soon as possible. Now, of course, when you have a family, I don't think you should be raising your family in the city, whether, whether the crisis is near or not. Um, and then I raised my, our, my our, in the our, country. Or the public education system? Yeah, or even uh, Adventist education. System. Yes, yes, I've heard the worst stories from. Yeah. And Ellen White like counsels, counsels uh, some families not to uh, go to Adventist schools. I picked my son up. Happened. I picked my son up once from summer camp and. He didn't speak for the, like the first 20 minutes of the ride. And I'm like, he's just really stoic. And I asked him, well, what's going on, Josh? He said that he, he was so upset that his friends were such hypocrites because there was an altar call. <clears throat> and all of them got up and went to the front. And he sat mm -hmm. there, arms crossed. He wasn't going up because he knew what they were like. Mm -hmm. And also he wasn't going to be false to himself. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of hope for him, for him because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I understand that. No, it and and it's the worst thing is for children to be exposed at a young age to the hypocrisy that exists within not just our schools but also the church. Um, that can be a real, yeah. real stumbling my, block for children. One of my sisters. Uh, the church sponsored her children to go to the church school. She's not Adventist, but that destroyed them 
their experience there. The cliques wouldn't include them. They were bullied. Yeah, by yeah, the you know, it's, it's, it was just a horror story. Yeah, well, I mean, the reason I didn't send my kids to school first off is uh, my 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 first wife Levine. She was she was raised in Christian schools, and and that was a terrible experience. Um, and then you know I'd went I'd gone to public schools and. Uh, which I just found to be a complete waste of my time. So, uh, and, and Levine's uncle, he was a teacher and he suggested we do unschooling, that we don't do schooling at all. And so that's what we did. The first three benefited from that the most because they never went to school. Um, the younger ones, as they got younger, they, you know, my wife put them into school, but, uh, when they got older, but, uh, they all benefited to some degree from homeschooling, which, uh, um, and I've seen with guitar students as well. But, I mean, that's a whole other topic. But um, <clears throat> the thing is, uh, we we need to recognize, and I've seen families that have moved into the cities and destroy their kids uh, as well. Being out in the country uh, and and spending time working with the kids, all those things are, are beneficial. But um, when it comes to the whole s- issue of the city, um, now, I do believe there are extremes in moving out of the cities because I've seen people move out of the cities into uh, and, and you know, everybody's got their different choices to make, but into such remote locations that all of their time is involved in just basic survival. And they have very little time to study and very little time to minister to others, very little contact with others. So, you know, Ellen White isn't saying that we should move out into such remote places that uh, it takes us days to get to uh, any sort of civilization. Uh, That's an extreme. But um, that we should be about an hour out of the cities and work the cities from outposts. Now, when you think about in her day, an hour out from the cities wasn't really that far, right? So what she's talking about is that close city living where you're living, you know, with no elbow room. So, so you know, she also talks about small towns and the benefit of those as well. That, uh, um, so, so there's a difference between a city and a town. Right. Yeah. Much a different. Where a town is described one way of uh, you're following someone and they don't need to use their signal light because you know where they're headed. <laughs> yeah well i lived in warburg and that was a pretty small town and uh yeah a lot of the rules that you would normally follow in the city you didn't follow though i did see an accident in warburg a car accident believe it or not probably made headlines <laughs> well, was a, probably the only time they ever had an accident a car accident in town but anyway a crisis is soon to come in regard to the observance of Sunday. And if the pro- in the if in the providence of God we can secure places away from the cities, the Lord would have us do this. There are troublous times before us. I see the necessity of making haste to get all things ready for the crisis. What warning will Sunday laws be to Adventists who still remain in the big cities? As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians. So the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains, right? So there's this sort of progression that she has in this regard. Now, obviously, if you have children, you shouldn't be living in cities. Don't raise your children in the city. Um, I would even say don't raise them in small towns. Raise them in the country so that they, you, know, you have gardens and you have, uh, you know, lots of space for them to roam, lots of things for them to do. <laughs> and uh, and don't put them in school. That would be my advice. Um, but there are people who do need to be in the cities for ministry purposes. But ideally, we should be outside the cities. But, you know, sometimes... And, uh, and medical purposes, too. 
Yeah, there, there's, there's, you know, there's always exceptions, right? It's not like everybody should be living out in the country, you know, with uh, an acreage and or a farm and, you know, working off the land. Not everybody's suited to it, for one thing. Um, it also depends on the stage of life in which you're at. And I have known some older people who have moved out way into the country and, you know, they're, they're older than me. So, um they're, they're not going to be able to sustain that lifestyle for long, right? Now, of course, living in the country and working physically is going to keep their health a lot longer. Um, but I think, you know, they could have done something a bit more moderate, some of the ones that I know. But, you know, it's it it's up to each verse person to listen to God, what is their duty and what's their responsibility. So there isn't a hard, fast rule for everyone. But, you know, country living is a whole big topic that uh, sometimes people can get emotional over. I've uh, had, had had country living in my mind ever since I read the little pamphlet, Country Living. But I lived in the cities and in the country off and on. But the last mm-hmm. 18, 18 years, I lived in, in the city of Calgary, a large city. And what I found is... I felt like I was impressed that it wasn't time for me to leave. God mm-hmm. would tell me, and, and he certainly did direct that. But yeah. uh, prior, to the, prior to that, I ran a business where I was going into people's homes, you know, right. ser- yeah. serving people in their homes, and I was giving away, you know, I was sharing steps to Christ with them and people that would never darken the door of a church, you know, mm-hmm. and, and wealthy people, I was ministering to them. So... Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, for me, I'm a guitar teacher and yeah. obviously I need students. If I was way out somewhere in the country, I would have very few guitar students. Now, somebody could say, well, I could do something different than teach guitar, but, you know, pretty much useless for anything else. Um, you know, it's just what I know how to do. Um, and God's led in that, right? It's obviously been a huge ministry, uh, having the guitar store and teaching guitar students, thousands of people that I came in contact with and planted thousands of seeds. And one day I, I know it will bear fruit, right? So there's this influence that we can have. So if we never see anyone, uh, it's pretty hard to be an influence. The seed, so, I'd like like to share this quick story. <clears throat> Running into a friend from high school about four years after high school, and I asked him at an evangelistic series, and I asked him, well, how did you end up here? He said, remember that book you gave me in high school? Well, about three years later, I wanted thought I wanted to be a Christian, and I remembered you giving me that book. I went back to my my parents' home and looked under my be- old bed, and I found it, and I became a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what book it was? David Dare? No, but what book the book is called? <clears throat> the, book, the, the book is called David Dare, I believe. Uh, Dare. It's about an uh, evangelist that would invite all the atheists and so on to come to the evangelistic series, and he would answer any question. They were allowed to interrupt him at any time. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So how are we to spend Sundays after the Sunday law is passed? Well, this is quite a different topic, but we'll, we'll look at this one. Seventh-day Adventists were to show their wisdom by refraining from their ordinary work on that day, devoting it to ministry effort. To defy the Sunday laws will but strengthen their persecution, in their persecution, the religious zealots who are seeking to enforce them. Give them no occasion to call you lawbreakers. One does not receive the mark of the beast because he shows that he realizes the wisdom of keeping the peace by refraining from work that gives offense. Whenever it is possible, let religious services be held on Sunday, Let the teachers in our schools devote Sunday to missionary effort. That's nine testimonies, 232, 233. Now, uh, A.T. Jones objects to this statement. He he tries to use it as an example that Ellen White was being uh, controlled. Uh, But I think the statement has to be put into context. And, and, And so make no demonstration on Sunday in defiance of the law. Nine testimonies, 235. So it's a little bit later. At one time, those in charge of our school in Avondale inquired of me, saying, what shall we do? The officers of the law have been commissioned to arrest those working on Sunday. I replied, it will be very easy to avoid that difficulty. Give Sunday to the Lord as a day for doing missionary work. Take the students out to hold meetings in different places. 
and to do medical missionary work. They will find the people at home and will have a splendid opportunity to present the truth. This, this way of spending Sunday is always acceptable to the Lord. Now, um, just a, a sort of a personal story. Um, my, my Auntie Faye, she, um, she used to live when she was single. She used to live with some Seventh day Adventists. I'm not sure where she lived, but there was like, um, maybe like a dormitory or something like that. So the people living in the house, uh, some of them were Adventists and some weren't. And, uh, the, the Seventh day Adventists would do their laundry on Sunday. And, and, and they were really, she was really upset about that, that they would wreck their Sunday by doing laundry on Sunday. Of course, they did their laundry on Saturday. <laughs> um, and a laundry used to be a bit of a chore, right? Not like nowadays, but, um, you know, and then there was, uh, some people in Rochester, Rochester, Alberta, um, that were Adventists. Um, and, uh, I guess, uh, the dad, you know, he would go out there on Sunday and work in the fields and his wife and children would throw rocks at him. (laughs) So I guess he was an Adventist, but his family wasn't. Um, but you know, it would have been so much wiser for the Adventists to respect the other person's day. Imagine if, you know, uh, these Adventists had respected the fact that the people didn't want them doing laundry on Sunday. Yeah, that's to me, the word graciousness comes into mind. Yeah. Or, you know, if this dad had just, you know, trusted that even though he wasn't going to harvest on Sabbath, that uh, God would also, you know, keep the harvest or whatever until, until Monday. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, so, I think that's what Ellen White really is talking about here. Um, it says, let religious services be held on Sunday. Mm-hmm. When, doesn't, sound, doesn't sound right to me. Well, yeah, I, well, uh, you I'm know, I'm going to continue to worship ever, on Saturday. I'm going to worship on Saturday, not Sunday. Right. But I, so I noticed that. Uh, as well, uh, I think that's being misused today because some Adventist yeah. churches are holding Sunday services, but for the wrong motive. Yeah. So what would be the right uh, motive? The context oh, of this. Evangelistic series? Do we ever have evangelistic series on Sundays? Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. Probably the highest turnout. Probably the highest turnout on Sundays. Yeah. So it's not in the, uh, the worship worship service the regular worship service yeah she's not talking here about a re- regular it, worship service and that, that is where it's being misused <clears throat> right churches uh having s- church services on sunday yeah. gives a f- wrong idea yeah. yeah so you know so you have to look at the context of what she's talking about i mean she's not saying yeah we should just have you know Sabbath and Sunday services in all of our churches so that we can attract Sunday keeping people. You know, that's not what she's saying. Right. But she is saying that we can do evangelistic services. We can do, there's lots of things we could do on Sunday if we're not allowed to work, if there's restrictions on work, but we can use that to our advantage. Right. That's basically what she's saying. Okay. Um, while living in, while we were living in Kurenbong, where the Avondale School was established, the Sunday labor question came up for consideration. It seemed as if the lines were soon to be drawn so tightly about us that we should not be able to work on Sunday. Our school was situated in the heart of the woods, far from any village or railway station. No one lived, no one was living near enough to be disturbed in any way by anything we might do. Nevertheless, we were watched and the officers were urged to observe what we were doing on the school premises. And they did come, but they did not appear to notice those who were at work. Their confidence and respect for our people had been so won by the work we had done for the sick in that community that they did not wish to interfere with our harmless labor on Sunday. At another time, when our brethren were threatened with persecution and were questioning in regard to what they should do, I gave them the same advice that I had given in answer to the question 
uh, concerning the use of Sunday for games. I said, employ Sunday to do missionary work for God. Teachers, go with your students. Let the teachers of our schools devote Sunday to missionary effort. Okay, so, I mean, there's a lot of counsel. There's a lot of things. Obviously, we can see here that we need to take things into context of what she's talking about. Uh, people misuse Ellen White coats to further their personal agendas. But, uh, you know, we should take time to, to study these things out. Uh, any any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. A dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath. And for each person, we just pray for your continued help as we study together um, throughout the week. And as we study individually, um, as we look at these things that um, you have brought to our attention. Uh, we pray, Lord, that um, your Holy Spirit can work upon our hearts and those around us. And we pray for our family and friends, uh, for our loved ones. We ask for your angels' care and protection. Help us to listen to your voice each day and to obey it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.